Okay, we'll start today. We're at the United States Air Force Museum from the Mary L. Cook Public Library in Waynesville, Ohio. Today is November 4th, 2002. And we're speaking today with Mr. Gilbert Unger. Mr. Unger, if you would begin and tell us about uh, your rank and where you served. Okay, I was a PFC and Theater of Operations was the ETO. Which stands for? European Theater of Operations. And you served in what time period? Well, my whole service started July of 43, and I was discharged in November, uh, I think, 5th of 45. Okay. And in what capacity did you serve? Well, uh, during the war, of course, I was uh, a machine gun. Do you have something to add? No. Okay. The same. Very simple assignment. All right. And uh, where did you receive your basic training? Fort Eustis, Virginia. Okay. And then after that, then you went to special gunner school? Oh, no. No, this was not aircraft gunner. Okay. This was strictly an aircraft gunner. Okay. And uh, I had a really nice time in Fort Eustis as far as the training goes. And then. Uh, we went to Fort Dix and had a little bit of training there. Not much, because actually it was over with. And then Kilmer waiting to go overseas, Camp Kilmer. And uh, another fortunate thing happened at Camp Kilmer. One of the barracks broke out with mumps, either mumps or measles, I don't remember which. So they were quarantined. So that was part of us. So they were. So we were held up. We had all that free time, almost two weeks. No one come as we wanted. You know, of course, uh, New York City was very close. Didn't cost you anything to go there. And, um, and so we took advantage of that. <laughs> uh, so on an average day, what was your day like? When are you speaking of? Well, after you've received your training, and then you're out, when well, let's During backtrack. The war, you mean, yes, when you let's backtrack though. After you received your training and before you're sent overseas, did you leave from that area? Camp Kilmer. Okay, and then you went overseas on a ship, I'm assuming. On the Queen Mary, no less. Okay, and uh, that took how long to get over? Seven days. Okay. And you arrived. March seventh. Left March first. March seventh, uh, 1943. And did you arrive in England? Yes. Fourth of Firth, I believe, uh, which is, uh, I used to know, know the name of the city, but I didn't know, in Scotland. Yeah. And uh, what happened then when you were in process over there? Was it just basic paperwork type of thing? Oh, in England? Mm -hmm. uh, no, in England we, uh, got, uh, we immediately got on a train. And uh, I don't, I don't recall how long the trip lasted, but we went from Scotland nonstop all the way to Land's End, mm -hmm. which is uh, the very southern tip of uh, England. And uh, we uh, uh, got off the train at a place called Oakhampton, <clears throat> and. Uh, it's my understanding that there was a big fence between us and some other troops that were right on the other side of the fence, but there was no communication and you couldn't go over there. You could see them. It was like a, uh, a chain link fence, but you could tell that they didn't want to bother with those people. And uh, I guess they were um, rangers because their equipment looked different than us. They weren't. They weren't um, paratroopers because there was no airfield, but they just looked and behaved different. And um, and Oakhampton was a very nice little uh, village, and we stayed there till just before the invasion. Well, no, we moved. We had a couple of movements. We went up to Whitby to practice firing. 
And so when you're speaking of the invasion, you're talking about D-Day. Yes. Uh, what was your name? Kathy. Kathy. Kathy, uh, I might say this. Um, we had one firing mission in England, and when we got up to there, it was called a place called Whitby. That's right on the coast of the North Sea. We would fire over the water. But the thing is, <clears throat> we were introduced to a brand new weapon. Prior to that, we were using 50 caliber single guns, this one single gun. And here, they introduced us to a turret affair with four guns. We've never seen that before. And so I guess that's one of the reasons they brought us up for training. And uh, we were up there about three days uh, learning how to use this new machine. And so, and then after that we went back to, um, and at that time we went back to Birmingham, England. And we left Oak Camp and we went back to Birmingham. Then uh, we hopscotched around to smaller and smaller villages until the invasion. And how much were you aware of about the invasion? Not at all. Uh, one uh, thing of interest there, of course, in England they had the blackout. And everything, there was no lights at all ever at nighttime. And, um, at that time, of course, we were moved close to the embarkation point. Now, we didn't even know that some of our people had already left. They were going to France already. I was what you call residue. That's, that's the term that they use for us, residue, not a very complimentary term. But we were left behind with heavier equipment and stuff like that. And some of our folks were already on the water. And uh, this, uh, the night of June 5th, we heard this tremendous roar of planes. In England, when you heard a plane at nighttime, and it, of course, it didn't matter, or we didn't see any enemy aircraft. They always had searchlights on it, and that was practice for the, anti, for the British anti-aircraft, for them just to practice tracking the aircraft. And it was very interesting to watch that. But it was just one a beam of light following the airplane. But June 5th, in fact, this is started in the afternoon. We thought of some kind of a practice. Well, and then when it got dark, all these planes taking off had lights on. Unheard of. They had wing lights, tail lights. And we thought, my goodness, look at that. They're all lit up. Of course, there were there weren't any beams of light following the searchlights. They were just going. And we watched, and then we lost interest, and we just went to bed or whatever. But uh, that was the invasion. That was usual. And like I say, some of our units and our regiment of the uh, division was already gone. And like I say, I was residue. The invasion <coughs> started the June 5th, scheduled for the morning of June 6th. I think I went uh, June 11th. It's residue. And you went because you were with heavier equipment at that time? Well, yeah, there was no heavy equipment. It was just, they didn't have room, I think, for everybody to go. So where did you go in? Utah Beach. When you arrived there, what did you see? Well, uh, after we had transferred from a Liberty ship to a landing craft, uh, a Liberty ship behind us hit a mine and blew up. And then a boat to our left, I don't know what kind of boat it was, it was big, it was already going under. Uh, this was June 11th or 12th. And uh, so this, quite a bit was happening on the water. And of course, there's a constant stream of aircraft going across. And the, um, the water was full of boats. Well, we started uh, unloading from the Liberty ship onto the landing craft about four in the afternoon. And they had no room for me, so I was up on top of a truck that was just full of equipment, the heavy stuff, that uh, 
Okay, I'll tell you about that in a minute. And uh, I was just laying on top, and uh, there was a slight drizzle, and then it stopped, and then a landing craft, uh, you know, landed. There was no firing. You know, Utah Beach was a very easy beach. It was the softest um, entry for the invasion on the whole uh, invasion beach. So the 90th Division was very lucky. But anyway, we uh, pulled up, by, but now it's dark. And uh, I will take my hat off to whoever was running the beach. It was just amazing. There were, I mean, I would say tens of thousands of vehicles and men and equipment. And you, but there was no chaos that I could see. We went in a line <coughs> up the beach, and this truck I was on was pulling <clears throat> that new weapon I told you about in a trailer. And um, an MP, like I say, it was sort of dark. An MP with a uh, flashlight, with one of those tubes of light, uh, waved our truck out of the line. And I was wondering why he waved this, because everyone else kept going. Of course, this group of people that just got off this landing craft were from various outfits, I believe. I'm not sure, but because, you know, I wouldn't know that. But anyway, we were told to get out of line. And so we pulled off, and there wasn't a lot of room to pull off, but as we pulled off, his flashlight passed something, which I thought, when, I, when our truck pulled up on the water, the first thing you do is dewaterproof. That's what you're trained. So you have to take off certain things off the vehicle so it can run on land. You know, you, you had a big, but that wasn't my job, that was the driver's job. But anyway, that took a little while. You had to be waterproof the, the vehicle. And while I was doing, while he was doing that, we were still in, in the line actually, the uh, MP kept waving his, uh, you know, his flashlight with various things. And I, he, his light kept uh, passing what I assumed was a big box of crates. And I thought, that must be ammunition that they're going to pick up and, and deliver. And then, uh, as he, my eyes got used to it anyway, it was a pile of bodies. It was uh, GIs that, that they were waiting to put on a ship to take out. So that was my first, uh, that was a little bit strange, but Anyway, so he pulled us out of line, and the guys were working feverishly to, only two guys were, well there was three, but only two were trying to deep waterproof the truck. And he says, unhook your weapon. So, of course, I have nothing to say about it, and I thought, gee, that's strange. Here he's taking the gun away. And now, he, and then he says, okay, get back in line got back in line, and we, it's hard to say how far we drove, because at that time, the beachhead wasn't very deep. So we drove, well, I, I don't know. Uh, we got to a place, uh, it was still dark, and we unloaded, and then that truck went away. That truck didn't belong to my battery. I don't know who's, who it belonged to. And remember I told you it was full of big stuff? I heard later, that all that stuff was dumped because they decided it was just too heavy and cumbersome to use. And uh, and we didn't have a weapon anymore. So I was wandering around. Um, I was like a fish out of water. All of us were. And then when uh, morning came, uh, we were just standing around not doing anything. Um, I could see that we were with our battery people, our battery. And don't you know that a brand new, I mean, that's why I say I got to give somebody a lot of credit, a brand new half track. I guess you know what that is. A brand new half track. It looked like it came out of a showroom. Beautiful paint and just love it. Brand new. It had never been any place. Came up, and that weapon that was on a trailer that we pulled up on the beach, 
now that same device was in the back of the hand. Wow, that's pretty doggone sharp. And of course now, it means that you didn't have to mess around the, with a trailer, you're self-propelled. And so that was very nice. And I was assigned, and that was the first time, I was assigned to a, what you call a, I guess a crew, a section, a gun section. And there were five of us. Two drove up in, in front of the half track, and three were up, up above. And of course, three of us up above were all gunners. So we were all gunners. And a corporal was a chief of section, and then a driver. And that was it. Oh, and I will say this. One of the reasons probably, and this is important, is I'm gonna, if I have time or whatever, I'll, I'll spring this on you. Um, the driver, which was the same guy that was there then, the driver had an accident driving the half track that it was assigned first. I'd never seen a half track. I'm talking about in Bournemouth, England, when they loaded the half tracks on some kind of a, a boat. Um, he had had an accident, and he ruined the front of the half track. So they had to substitute quickly because there was an evasion going on. I had no idea of this going on. So that might be also one of the reasons that this vehicle was so brand new. They had a substitute. And, and and now, I'll tell you, this half-track that I was on was unique in the fact that the front bumper had a roller on it. It had like a rolling pin that rolled so that you could like hit a fence or hit a uh, anything and it would be like a buffer and you could roll through if it wasn't too, if it wasn't brick wall. The, uh, all the other half tracks, and no other half track that I ever saw had that roller, unless it was a not an anti aircraft half track. Other half tracks, and ours included, had a winch on the bumper so that if it got stuck, they could pull themselves out of trouble. We didn't have that. So we had a unique vehicle. And so uh, if, this, if it comes up, I'll tell you why the uniqueness uh, stood out. So after you, you got situated there on the beach and you got with your equipment, then did you proceed to a particular town? What was your... No, no. Uh, from then on, uh, no. We were very seldom in a town. We would drive through them, but very seldom in a town. No, once, uh, once we were assigned to, like I was assigned to this vehicle, five guys, and uh, uh, then and a light anti-aircraft is the machine guns and what you call a 40 millimeter gopher's cannon. It's a, it's a, a larger, it's a 40 millimeter cannon. There's, there's one in this museum. And um, so that was, uh, so we just went in, in a convoy going out, but like I say, the bridgehead wasn't very deep and it was very crowded. The, the, uh, I bet you we weren't six or seven, I don't, I don't know how far in, but uh, not very far. And uh, now that I know history, I've read a bunch of books, the uh, high command, Eisenhower and those people, were really getting worried because we couldn't widen the uh, bridgehead the beachhead, and so they thought they were going to push us back in the water. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that point, uh, uh, like this is the middle of June, we hadn't fired a shot yet. There was nothing to shoot at. England, during the Battle of Britain, had taken care, good care, of the German Air Force. They must have knocked down a good percentage of so in fact is, uh, I think historically, only as I read, I never saw it, only one German aircraft flew over the beach during the uh, invasion, mm -hmm. one. And I guess he was taking pictures. They didn't have much of an air force left. And uh, so we never fired. And there was nothing to fire at. And uh, until 
what they call the breakout at St. Lo. That was a significant uh, battle. Uh, if I could backtrack, one of the guys that I told you that went in, at June uh, 5th, he said that he wasn't a gunner. He was, he was a corporal, and he had uh, some kind of special training. I don't know what. Anyway, he, he went on the beach at Utah Beach with a Navy person to help this Navy person and he to identify enemy aircraft. Because the Navy had a notorious reputation for shooting down American planes. They just couldn't identify American airplanes or any airplanes. And so they wanted to prevent that from happening. And I'm sure there were other people doing the same thing. But this guy, and, he, and because there was no airplanes, he says he and this Navy guy sat in the Jeep. They just sat there. They didn't do anything for two or three days. And so then they parted company. That I guess the Navy guy went back to the boat, and he uh, took the Jeep and uh, caught up with us. So that was a very interesting thing. There was nothing going on as far as yeah. OK, so. Um, um, so the breakout at St. Lo was uh, the operation where um, the guys uh, at uh, Shafe headquarters decided the only way they're going to break the stalemate of the bridgehead is to just bomb everything to a depth of so many miles. Bomb everything, just flatten everything. And then that will give us a chance to go, to, to advance. Anyway, I'll make the long story short. They had the uh, bombing raid, and uh, many of the bombs in our area fell short. A, a general was killed, and 200 uh, GIs were killed. Uh, you know, and uh, General McNair, I think, who was uh, the head of the Air Force at the time, felt so terrible because of the it wasn't a mistake, they just fell short. That always happens. He uh, went to Eisenhower and he said, uh, if you uh, tell us, we'll never have a, what you call a carpet bombing again. We just won't use that as a tactic. And Eisenhower says, no, you know, these kind of things happen. And uh, if it's called for, we'll do it again. So anyway, during that bombing, well, I'm not going to tell you the way it goes. Anyway, Okay, so here our half-track is driving through uh, on the edge of St. Lo. We didn't go through the city. And it was bombed to such a degree that it was like driving through a sand pile. I mean, they had just obliterated everything. And as we're driving, like I'm up above, right? And I see a baby laying in the debris. But it's not covered over, and it's just laying there with the hands up and the feet up. I said, my God, there's a baby. And I stopped the half track. By the way, I must tell you, once, uh, at this point, we're not in a convoy anymore. Now the war is on. We're in the war, even though we haven't done anything. And so we're never in a convoy after that. We're always a separate vehicle going our way. Someone tells us where to go, but we're always by ourselves. So it's easy for us to stop. I said, stop uh, the vehicle. And I jumped down and ran over to this baby. I picked it up. And it turned out to be a life-size doll. It was about this big, a life-size doll, like a baby of seven or eight months of age. So just for the heck of it, I brought it back to the, to the truck. I always call it a truck. It's a half truck. And I got in the back. and. And we went on. About two or three days later, we wondered what to do with this dial baby. So here's what we did. We wired it to the radiator, to the front of the half track. And then we says, well, OK, let's name our vehicle. So we called it Baby Buggy. And we, we painted these names on ourselves. Baby Buggy up in front. Baby buggy on both doors. Now I'm told you're going to tell you a story. So from then on, we're baby buggy. And we went through the whole war with that dowel 
And every time we would pass through like a village or something, the French girls would go wild. And they would run out in front of us and try to stop us. They wanted to steal that, that doll baby, but we never gave it away. We would never give that doll baby away. And um, so, uh, oh, so um, can I digress now? Sure. Okay. Somehow or other, a model maker, you know, that makes model airplanes and stuff like that, a commercial in Texas. I don't know, you have a serendipitous things that happen. He, uh, he, well, I'll tell you exactly how it happened. I wrote him a letter. And I said, do you make models of the M16? The M16 is the model of our half track with the guns and stuff. He says, no, we don't. Why are you interested? And I told him, you know, I was on one and uh, and we called it Baby Buggy, and why we called it Baby Buggy, because I got that down, and blah, blah, blah. Well, I want you to know, Kathy, our half-track is the only model that I know of that is an exact replica of, of an M16. In other words, they make generic M16s. A lot of model makers make them big and small, but ours is not a generic. Ours is exact. The generic ones have any kind of numbers on, and they have the bumper with a winch. Ours has a roller, the model I'm talking about, and it has our a serial number on it. It has our exact um, uh, 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 unit designations. Uh, in other words, we were battery B, and we were the 11th gun section, so we call B11, 537th Annie Garrett. 537 AA, 3rd Army, and I guess that's all. And then it says Baby Buggy on the two doors and on the front. It's the only one that I know of. And this uh, model is being sold uh, all over the world. It's made in England. So that's an interesting story. It's the only one that I've ever heard of. Because you can buy a, a model of it, but it doesn't say Baby Buggy you know, or all that other stuff. So that's interesting. Um, and now I'm going to backtrack to the first time uh, we fired. I guess you're interested in that kind of stuff. And you know what? Now that I, it comes to my mind, I don't remember if this happened before or after St. Louis. You'd have to look at a map to find that out. Anyway, um, it was at nighttime. Never, ever in training or any time fired at night. So uh, we were, uh, I told you we never went to a little village, but we were right in the center of the little village here. Why? Because this village had five bridges. A little tiny town, but it had five bridges. And we had to protect those bridges. Not just us, I mean, other anti-craft was scattered all around. So, uh, and here at nighttime, we hear aircraft couldn't see them, so we didn't fire. What are we going to shoot at? So we just sat still. And then all of a sudden, the light sort of lit up, the sky sort of lit up. They were dropping flares. Now, we'd never been trained. Let's see, do we shoot at a flare or not? <laughs> we didn't know. So some guys started shooting at them. So we said, okay, this is fun. So we started firing at the flares. And then the bombers started dropping bombs. I don't know how many planes there were, or, you know, but they, they were just going around. It was just chaos. And we were just firing, and this was the experience. There's four guns, and the muzzles are, are not too far from your face. Well, you go blind. You know, the brightness against the dark sky, you can't see a thing. You can't see anything. No one ever told us that, you know, in training. So we're just firing blindly, and uh, but quite a bit. We think if we spray the sky, four guns at all at once going off, that we're going to hit something. Well, as far as I know, no one hit anything, and all the bridges were intact. In the morning, oh, wait a minute. Something did happen. I just had it. A bomb did come close enough to us that it threw up so much dirt 
We pulled a trailer with our supplies. We had ammunition in it, we had food, we had clothes, we had extra barrels for the guns. It was a trailer that we pulled. And it, it, was, it had the wooden staves over and then canvas. Enough dirt or something fell on top that broke in the top of the trailer. Didn't hurt us because, of course, when we set up, we detached the trailer. It was sitting by itself. And in the morning, when you know when it cleared, I don't know if you know, you'll understand this, but you know when you fire a, a bullet, it makes a shell, an empty casing. Uh, the bed of the half track was full of empty shells. When we dumped it out, I mean we had to get rid of it. It was just a bunch of junk. It made a pile almost as high as a half track thousands and thousands of uh, shells. So it was a lot of fun. We didn't do any damage that I know of, but it sure was a nice Fourth uh, of July celebration. No, it wasn't the Fourth of July. <laughs> so uh, they go on, uh, that, that's about it. Um, we, we went all the way into Czechoslovakia for the 90th Division, uh, and um, uh, our our uh, big thing was because we were self-propelled. We could move at, at a moment's notice. So what we did, we always went early to a river crossing to protect the river crossing. We would come up to the river, then the infantry would come up, and they would have these little boats, and, and they would go across. We were there first, and then they would come to protect and um, we, we were never attacked at a river crossing that I can remember. Well, except for, except once at uh, the Rhine River. And that was uh, where we, for, our, for the first time, saw jet aircraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, Germany introduced that and we were, more or less powerless to shoot them down. They went too fast. But um, I think a few were shot down. But uh, and we went into Czechoslovakia. What did you find when you got there? Where? In Czechoslovakia. Um, well, that was sort of sad. Uh, by that time, they had installed a little tiny communicating radio. None of us knew how to use it, but we could receive. Uh, it was supposed to be uh, radio. You should have been able to talk to headquarters. We never learned how to use it. We didn't care. The war was on. So, but we heard the Czech people pleading, "Please come to Prague." We were very close to Prague. Please come to Prague. Please liberate Prague. And we stood still because uh, Truman, at that time, had made a deal with Russia, and that was a tragic mistake. We couldn't go any further, and uh, we did, uh, and that was terrible. Well, uh, we did uh, liberate, not me personally, but my outfit liberated a uh, one concentration camp. Oh, and in, in Czechoslovakia, of course, the Germans didn't want to surrender to the, Germ uh, to the Russians. That would have been sh for sure death. In, probably instant. So they were streaming west in just like unbelievable. And we, you know, the war the war's not over. But we don't we're not firing because these people are surrounding surrounding. This one column, they had tanks, they had Jeep like things, trucks, just every kind of a of a vehicle you could think of that the Germans had. And plus just bedraggled soldiers walking and marching. And the, uh, at the head of the count, this is, I'll never forget this particular scene, at the head of the count was a uni uniformed woman, no helmet on, and no shirt or coat, just a brassiere. It was April, it was warm, it was already getting warm, and I guess she was hot. But she was leading that count. Now what the significance of what it meant, I don't think it meant anything. But that was the case. That was what I saw. 
And um, this, uh, th this uh, was an entire division, I found out later, that this, uh, the commander of that German division made a deal that he would uh, surrender only to the 98th Division, which was our division, and they made a deal. I think the reason being we had come up against them someplace else in France, and they had, sort of had a, like a mutual respect or something for each other. So, so this was uh, right at the time that Eisenhower was of surrender that you're talking about. Ah, uh, yes, that was a little, well, that was surrender. It wasn't the end of the war officially. Maybe a couple of weeks ahead of time. The war was over May 8th, I think. And this had to be, let's see, we took Boston to April. This had to be, oh, this had to be April. And then, did you serve as an occupation force after then? Uh, they did, but not me. Uh, it's not a war story, but it's a good story. We were sent back to a camp for rest. After you fire, by the way, I, I didn't, we have cut it for 29 airplanes. Shooting down. Not my gun. I'm talking about the battery, battery B. We have official credit for 29 airplanes. My gun has unofficial uh, um, uh, credit for a category one. That means a single gun brought down a single airplane. Mm -hmm. And the reason I didn't even know about it is because um, I didn't see the airplane fall. I saw it smoking, but I, you have to see it crash to get a cor category one. I never saw that. Mm -hmm. Someone else saw it further away, and we were the only ones firing. Mm -hmm. So big deal. And, I, and uh, by the way, we did lose one of our, we were five men to start the war. We ended up four. One of the guys turned out to be, I, I, well, I guess you'd call it, just didn't want to be in the war. So they sent him to the infantry, <laughs> actually. Those kind of people, they just got rid of him. So we were only four men. And I did, I did all the firing during the entire war, except at one time, well, when I was wounded, I wasn't firing. If I had been firing, I wouldn't have been wounded. If someone, if the other guy was, and so that was it. But uh, I was going to tell you, uh, I was going to tell you, what was it? Um, about the surrender? No. Well, oh, about, uh, about the occupation. When we pulled back from Czechoslovakia, we came to a city called Weiden. In German, you'd say Wieden, W-E-I-D-E-N. It's the first time since we left England that we saw girls wearing lipstick. And that really was exciting, because they didn't have lipstick, you know. And that was sort of very exciting. But, uh, and of course, you were forbidden to fraternize and all that kind of stuff. So, um, oh, so during the war, they sent us back to a rest camp. And when you go to a rest camp, they give you about three days just to recover. They give you new clothes, all new clothes, and uh, they take the guns and recalibrate them. Because all that firing shakes them and they get loose. They re-aim them. We don't, the ordinance people. They re-aim them. They go over the motor of the... It's a real fix-up. Well, I'm sitting there in this camp. It's a uh, coal mine camp in France. And so there's a, a, a mess hall and barracks. It was really nice. And there's a band playing. And I played in my high school band. I consider myself a, a clarinet player. And I look and I see, my golly, I know that guy walking in front of the band. So I went up to him. I said, hey, Aren't you Bob Dawson from Roosevelt High School, Dayton, Ohio? He says, I sure am. <laughs> That's all I had to hear. I said, Bob, get me in the band. And he says, you're as good as, he didn't know me. He was a senior and I was a freshman or something like that. He didn't know me personally. And I only knew him because he stood up in front of the band and he played the baton. And so he says, you're as good as in. 
So, uh, of course, the transfer didn't happen until long after the war was over. It happened once we were in occupation. But the occupation uh, uh, duties weren't assigned yet. No one knew what to do. So all we were doing was cleaning guns, and they were turning them into the ordinance people or something like that. We were just sitting around. We weren't doing anything. The transfer comes in. Was that something? So I spent, must have been, June. it must have been from the middle of June till the 1st of November. I was in a division band. And of course, they didn't care if I could blow or couldn't blow. Never had a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, at that point, never had a rehearsal. And um, uh, that, see, I was a young kid. I was a very young kid, a very naive, and I didn't know. These guys were older. Uh, if they didn't know the ropes, they would have never gotten out into a division van at the first place. You know, uh, they would have been carrying a rifle or something. They had to have connections or something. They were in the band from the very beginning. So they knew some history. And the 90th Division took Bayreuth, Bavaria. That's a city in Bavaria. What is Bayreuth? Bayreuth is the birthplace of Richard Wagner. Composer. And there's a what they call the Wagner Festspiel House. That means a, a concert hall just dedicated to Wagner's operas. They knew about it. We were the first ones in, and they were uh, they didn't bargain for this. When they, the band didn't play, see with Patton, you didn't. There was no. It was all business, and he didn't need a band during a war. After a war, fine. Let's have a band. During the war, these guys were stretcher bearers. They lost about six or seven guys. They worked very hard during the war, never touched their instruments. They, so it wasn't such a wonderful deal for them during the war. They never carried a gun, but it was bad. But anyway, they knew about the concert house. They, they swarmed like bees on that place, cleaned it out. And um, there weren't any instruments that they could use, that I had heard about. And, but they got a lot of music. And uh, this one guy, Sergeant Davis, I'll never forget him, but I've never seen anything about this. He showed me a packet of manuscript, and that's where you write the music by hand, that Wagner wrote for his nephew as a birthday present. Mm -hmm. So that's priceless. Mm -hmm. So either he wasn't, a, Either he didn't get to take it home to the States or something, but they be, he said, someday you're going to read about this in the paper. Well, I never read about it, so I don't know. But uh, uh, in my outfit, there was one distinguished service cross given uh, to one of the guys in another battery, Battery D. That's the second highest uh, award you can get. And uh, any number of... Uh, Silver stars and brown stars and purple hearts. And uh, how were you wounded? Yes. And how did that happen? Well, uh, the, the, okay, this happened at the Rhine River. I told you the uh, German Air Force through the whole war was more or less non existent. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we did have credit for 29 airplanes, but they were far and few between, and it took a whole year for that to accumulate. So, you know, uh, oh, they had uh, uh, V1s and V2s, and we saw many of those, not the V2s, but the V1s, but we were always ordered not to shoot those, because they'd come right down where you were, and so, okay. So, um, we're at the Rhine River, and we were there for quite a while, because it was a very wide river, and it was very difficult to get across. And this was the last gasp of the German Air Force. You say, once you cross the Rhine, then Germany is lost. So they were sending over every kind of aircraft they could. Old ones, new ones, but, and we've seen this a couple of weeks ahead of now, they sent over jet aircraft. That's a brand new invention. We've never seen a jet aircraft. And so this was exciting to us. And um, anyway, we're sitting there. We were not at the river's edge. We were uh, 
farther back in, in like a field. And I, oh, I know what was happening now, I remember. This field was filling up with the troops that were going to go across, and they couldn't get across, so they're like filling this field up. Well, uh, to protect these people, there was uh, a chemical outfit that was making artificial smoke. And they were filling this place, you couldn't see anything. Of course, when a breeze would come up, then you could see, and it was a sort of an eerie thing. Uh, so anyway, we would look up and we could hear aircraft, and with, seldom would the, the clouds or this fog that they were making, part that you, you could see to fire. And uh, so I was, a half track has a rail along the bed that's on the outside. So I was standing on that rail outside of the half track, and the turret's up here, and so Carl was up here in the turret, and he was waiting for a chance to fire if he could see anything. The reason I was standing here, to help him see, because you couldn't see. And I was trying to, you know, look through. Well, just at that time, remember this field is full of people waiting to, to get across the river. Um, just at that time, three jet aircraft, three, swooped down. They didn't do anything. They swooped down and zoom. And just then, just then, just before they came, the clouds parted. And we could see, oh wow, look at that. Following them, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, came two Focke-Wolves. I don't remember. One might have been a Focke-Wolf and a Michigan. Anyway, they were strafing and bombing. They, you know, it was a roost. Those guys came first, and then this came in low. He said, apparently they knew there was a lot of guys down there. They were dropping bombs and strafing. Uh, they, the bombs weren't big ones. They were anti-personnel bombs. And they, the string, you know, they would just go in a line. And I was hit by shrapnel. Standing on the back of the half track, I was completely exposed. The half track is armored. I was on the outside. And so anyway, I was hitting in the back of the leg. And, um, oh, and then we got a lot of uh, flack. Flack, that's what we send up. We got a lot of complaints. Why did we fire? Because that let them know that we were there. And they, of course, well, anyway, and then they had a better target where there was no smoke. There was a whole big convoy of uh, tanks and everything waiting to get across that river. They were jammed up. It was like a, a traffic jam. And the, those planes just really did a lot of damage. I don't know how much damage. And so they said we should have never revealed our position by firing. But that's silly. It was daytime that we've seen them. And uh, they did a lot of damage there. And that's how I was uh, wounded. Um, it wasn't a very, very severe wound, uh, but I uh, fell off the half track and just laid there, and then I thought to myself, what was it? It was just a sting, really. And I thought, it might have been a rock. So I stood up, and then there was blood, you know, and so uh, I didn't want to open my pants to see exactly what was going on. <laughs> so we called a medic, and the medic came over, and. Um, he fixed me up right then and there. And he says, well, I want a Purple Heart. Well, that's the third time I was hit. I refused Purple Hearts twice before. And of course, by this time, I got a little wise. Because every time you get one, it gives you five points to go home. So I said, sure, I'll take one. Actually, on the other two times, see, this was direct enemy action. The other was secondary. It was because a bomb fell or a shell hit, and because, and you weren't hit by that, you were hit by something else, like a ricochet. Well, that's not, and so I would never accept for that. But so that was the third time I said, okay, I'll take it. The war's almost over. I said, my God, I might as well get five points. I won't get another chance. <laughs> so I took it. Well, as we start to wrap up here, is there anything that we've overlooked that you would like to mention? Well, if I can just get political a little bit. Uh, I'm very uh, disappointed with uh, 
my government, the fact that they didn't, and they could have so easily done more for the uh, liberating the concentration camps. In what way? They could have bombed the rail heads leading into the camps. That would have crippled that particular operation. Crippled it. Because uh, they couldn't afford to transport those people in trucks. You know, there's not enough trucks. So that's very bad. And um, I saw some very bad things in Czechoslovakia, which was a result of the, of the uh, Nazi occupation there. Czechoslovakia, you know, you heard of Lidice, where they wiped out every man in, in the city, in the little village. Um, so, um, stuff like that could have be, been prevented. We were sitting, just sitting in uh, Czechoslovakia, while the Russians were moving as fast as they could. And uh, the Germans, uh, it was a policy apparently that they had to cause as much devastation as they could. And they did. Uh, I saw a pile, I, I can't say it that they were, they weren't in uniforms. They weren't in the concentration camp uniforms. They were just in clothes, civilian clothes. So I don't know who they were if they were just Czechoslovakian civilians or out of, if they've been emptied out of a uh, concentration camp or whatever. It doesn't matter. It, it was the strangest sight I've ever, I've ever seen. You know how sardines are packed in a can. Well, this was a perfectly s square object. Perfectly square. Perfect. You could, you could put a... a a, a carpenter square on it, and it would, wouldn't be off. And it was higher than I am, and it must have been, oh, I don't know. it must have been 12 feet one way, and 12 feet the other, I don't remember that. And it was people. I don't even know how they did that. How could, how could they do it so perfectly? I don't know, was it an object lesson? I can't imagine. You know, it just blows my mind. I, it was the strangest thing. I've never seen anything like that. In uh, Susitia, where uh, we ended up, that's a little tiny town, um, the Czechs were rounding up collaborators and any stray Germans they could find. They were really taking care of them. Um, so that was uh, bad. In the, in the hindsight of history, I know that Roosevelt and Truman could have done, and Eisenhower, could have done a lot more than they did for the uh, concentration camp people. That's not a war objective, it's not a military objective, but uh, you know, what were we there for? We were there fighting an evil, and that certainly would have been, I hope, but anyway, that's, I feel very disappointed now that I know that. I didn't know it at the time. And um, uh, I, I do know that uh, there were men in my unit that disappeared. And I found out later that they were not uh, psychologically uh, suited invasion. This happened before the invasion. They just disappeared. I mean, they did something with them. They didn't, they didn't kill them right now. They just gave them or sent them home. So four, four people just vanished out of my battery. And, uh, and then, uh, uh, oh, and my captain and Captain Levine the first two captains of my battalion to go to France. The other two captains, Captain Douglas, God, I can't remember the other guy, um, or Captain England, with, like with me, or at the, with residue, and then they came over. And I heard 
then. Uh, it was only because uh, our back, my captain and Levine, were considered by the 90th Division to be the more adept leaders. And, uh, and that was sort of a, a lesson to me. And then during the war, as we, as we progressed wherever we went, you know, uh, I was a good friend of uh, the uh, first sergeant. Didn't see him often, but he would sometimes uh, pass by in the jeep. How's everything? You know, how's everything going? And I say, okay, you know. He say, I said, my God, he says, that damn German Jew, he's going to get us killed someday. But he wasn't saying that in a derogatory way. It's because he flexed his muscles our back. He moved us. He didn't, you know, he was a very excellent officer. So Johnson, Henry Johnson from Minnesota, he loved him. But he, he, he knew I was Jewish and he, uh, our back was. So, you know. One more thing. Um, during the Battle of the Bulge, it was, we were there. Um, they needed every every red-blooded, uh, hot, warm body to carry a rifle. So what they did, they went through all the outfits, like anti-aircraft, uh, kitchen people, uh, service people, supply people, and cleaned out the dead wood. Yeah, they didn't take any body. They took people from my battery, but I, I don't really know. Well, it was, it was one. They took, you know, a number of people. Remember, we were uh, only four people, so I, I, I didn't know everything was going on. I couldn't. But uh, I heard this later. Every Jewish guy in the other bathrooms, except I'm, I'm sure from the beach, was shut down. Don't live on giant green linebacks. You can't tell me that they were such bad soldiers. I know that from my own observation, or better than anybody else they had to be. The fact is, the one guy, Lenny Cohen from Boston, he was sort of a big guy, and Captain Douglas, well, anyway, uh, they gave him a BAR. Uh, they gave him a very heavy gun to carry. Well, he was a big guy, and the funny thing was, he kept throwing it away and just picking up a regular rifle. And then his lieutenant would say, God damn it, Cone, here's another one. Because he was the only guy that was really able to handle it. We were any aircraft people. We were all machine gunners. And so we had a lot of training. And a BAR could be used as a handheld machine gun. So um, I guess that's what we used. Anyway, he ended up a staff sergeant with all kinds of decorations. And Captain Douglas, got rid of him from a supposedly soft job and thinking maybe he'll get killed in the infantry. I don't know about that. Anyway, he put him in the infantry. Why? Because his name is Leonard Cohn. There he was only a private. He ended up as a staff sergeant <clears throat> with all kinds of decorations. So you figure it out. Yeah. But uh, I had fun. I really enjoyed the service. Uh, it was great. Uh, the fact that I had a, a Jewish captain, I don't think had much to do with it. The fact that I was on a vehicle, I didn't have to walk. I rode every place and could play around with four machine guns at one time. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> I didn't have to work. I didn't have to dig holes. It was great. And we're out of tape.